So we've spoken about market structure. The next thing to cover is definitely going to be supply and demand. Supply and demand is very important. It plays a very big part in our trading and it is going to be where we get our entries and also what we use for our targets as well. So understanding supply and demand is really, really important. So what actually is supply and demand? Well, supply and demand refers to areas in the market where buy orders or sell orders are accumulating. When we hit a supply or demand zone, we normally get a fast reaction from that zone in a given direction. So if we use what we spoke about in the previous episode about market structure and consider this as a bullish trend, what we can do is identify demand zones because demand zones are bullish, supply zones are bearish. I'll talk about those in a moment. We can identify demand zones with the trend and we can use these to buy from. So looking at this example, then if we have an uptrending market, we have a higher high, a higher low, and then we have a higher high once again. This break of structure can then lead us to find the demand zone that broke the structure and focus on that for buys. So we wait for a higher high, then we wait for a pullback into a demand zone. And then this is where we would look to actually get our buy trades on. And then we can take the market higher. Now, the opposite, a supply zone is the exact same thing, but in a bearish market. Supply zones come in before lower lows. And when they do, we can look towards those supply zones to sell the market and profit from a continuation down. So I'll show you some live examples, but before we do that, I think we should talk about what supply and demand shows and why it actually happens in the market. Most traders, first of all, are programmed to follow support and resistance. A support level is basically a level that price bounces off numerous times like this, and a resistance level is where price bounces off to the upside. So this is a support and resistance area. The support is down here, price bounces off it. Resistance is up here, price bounces off it. But this doesn't actually work most of the time because the market is going to follow supply and demand. So let's say then we had a supply zone above here and we were in a downtrend. What we would actually see a lot of the time is price come into the supply zone and then actually sell off from there instead of from the support and resistance. So support and resistance becomes redundant when you understand the concept of supply and demand. And the reason this happens is because support and resistance are essentially just lines that you've drawn on the chart. When you see price bouncing from a certain level a couple of times, you draw a line on there and call it a resistance. The problem is there isn't much logic behind it, whereas supply and demand zones have a lot of logic behind them and they actually follow the real flow of orders in the market. OK, so if we consider this demand zone, what this is showing us is an area that buying control came in. In the previous episode, we spoke about the battle between buyers and sellers and how when the market's in an uptrend, the buyers are in control. And when the market's in a downtrend, the sellers are in control. We're following that concept by actually seeing where are the buyers buying and where are the sellers selling. When we have a higher high and the correction comes in, the bottom of that correction is normally going to form a demand zone. And we consolidate for a little bit before making a large push to the upside. And if it continues the trend, we can then see that, OK, the buyers are still in control because they've managed to push through the previous high and the trend is continuing. Now that we know the buyers are in control, we can actually think, where did the buyers enter the market? OK, and we can see that if we look towards the bottom of the large movement, we're normally going to see a demand zone. And that is where the buyers orders came on, which drove the market through. So we know that this area that we found is a large area for buying is a very favorable area for buy orders to be accumulated. So then we can actually use that. And when the market comes back into it, we can say, right, this is an area that people were happy to buy at. This is a price level that people liked to buy this asset or this currency pair. And then when the market pulls back into that, we can look at that once again as an area to continue buying. So we can actually look to place orders here to continue the market to the upside. And basically what we're doing is following the volume and following the flow of orders that are moving bullish in the market. If the buyers are in control, we can just look for where the buyers took that control and then use that for future buys. On the flip side, if we are looking at supply zones, we are seeing the exact same thing. We know sellers are in control. And when we get the correction, we are looking to see are sellers going to continue control or are they going to lose it when they continue it? And that shows us that a lot of selling came in at this level. We can then refocus on this level for shorts once again. And when the price hits this region again, we can then just sell it again. OK, so that is the basic premise of supply and demand. We are following that battle between buyers and sellers. Now, where do supply and demand zones form? Well, the first place they form is at the bottom of movements and at the top of movements as well. So we may get a demand zone like this and we may get a supply zone at the top of a movement like this. So these are just like the example I showed you where we have a demand zone there and we are looking for price to trade into it. And this is also like that where we have a supply zone here 
and we are looking for price to come and trade into this to sell it off okay so that is the most basic area you go and see supply and demand that is going to be how we do a lot of trades where we are looking for those supply and demand zones to be filled however before we actually get into some examples i need to show you the other places that supply and demand zones form and that is midway through an impulse so let's say then we are in an uptrend like so we come back down retest that demand zone then we have a move up here and then we consolidate like so and then we get a move up this is then a demand zone right so it's an area where we reaccumulate or basically an area where the market flats out while new buy orders are accumulated now let me show you what that really means starting off then we have this initial demand zone we have an area where buyers come into the market the market takes off it pulls back in to get to that premium price area again that nice price area where people are happy to buy people rebuy the market makes another move up when we see this however that shows us that this buying has actually dried out a little bit and we've actually stopped here we've stalled here in the market around this price area then when we see this takeoff that shows us that it's this area of you know reaccumulation rebuying where the market has actually built the strength to make the next move up and as we can see this is actually the area that broke the structure so this is a very important thing to actually keep track of when we get a demand zone that forms just beneath the break of structure or we get a demand zone that forms within the corrective move basically within that substructure so to speak of the previous move this is the area i actually want to focus on when it comes into buying because you have to keep in mind the reason why we are buying and selling supply and demand zones we are buying demand because it's the area where the buying comes in it's the area we've seen buying come in in the past and we know it's an area that people are happy to buy in so we want to buy the strongest areas we want to buy the areas the strength is coming from if, for instance, we see the market is pushed up from this zone but failed to break the structure, that shows us that the strength to break structure is not coming from here. That shows us the strength to break the structure is coming from this point here. So when we get a movement like this, where we get a push up and then we consolidate and then we take off, we then want to focus on this zone instead. Okay, does that make sense? And that is the other big place that you're going to see supply and demand come into a market. Oftentimes it's going to be in the lows of the movements at the bottom of each corrective move like this but sometimes we are going to see these phases where we consolidate before breaking and these zones are going to become the ones we want to focus on then for our trades so basically as a quick clear note this is the one thing you need to remember we are generally bar a few exceptions which you'll learn later in the course we are generally looking at the zone that broke structure okay those four words very important zone that broke structure that is the one we want to see because that is the one where the strength is coming from whether we are buying whether we are selling we generally want to look bar a few exceptions at the zone that broke structure okay so if we get a movement like this where this zone broke the structure then that is the zone we want to focus on but if we get a movement like this where this zone is not the zone that broke structure and this reaccumulation area is that's the one we want to focus on remember the reason behind it all we are looking at the areas with the strength to drive the market and that is where we want to then buy or sell from in the future so we've spoken about the principles of supply and demand now and it's time to bring this to the charts and have a look at some real life examples now before we get into it i just want to have a look at how do we actually plot supply and demand zones well a general rule is to use the last bearish candle before the bullish candle uh, or the last bullish candle before the bearish candle and that is widely accepted so for example in this movement here we have this last bearish candle before the bullish movement happens and that is where you use your zone now i actually do things slightly differently uh, it does confuse people sometimes when they look at my supply and demand zones i don't always use that concept i look for the most fitting area okay so if we have a very messy area like this i'm normally going to opt for the large candle like so that covers all of the range and then if i want a tighter zone i can go to lower time frames and refine that we will talk about refining zones when we get to the application process but continuing with that topic if we are looking at a big messy area i'm going to use the one that clears all the highs of the zone and actually just really accounts for that whole area if i am looking at a bullish movement and we have a huge zone like this i'm normally going to opt for the smaller area because it's the more refined area so if i was looking at a demand zone here i'd be looking towards this candle rather than this candle here Obviously, going to different time frames will kind of change your perception and change the view of what you're looking at. But I just find it more fitting to use, you know, a, a suitable candle. And normally the candle I'm looking for is the last candle before the impulsive move begins. So as you can see here, when I marked out this initial example, this is the last candle before we really started selling off. 
when we looked at this buying point, this was the last kind of sideways or reversal candle before the impulsive move there. Um, if we were to look at this area, I would actually be looking towards probably this candle, this smaller one here, um, and you know, accounting for stops under the wick, or I'd be looking towards this one. Just basically looking for the last candle before the impulse, which really in this instance is going to be this small blue one there. Um, if we were looking at this area, we have two supply zones. So one of them is this area, uh, and that's another thing as well. So these candles are called dojis or spinning tops, but basically where we have a small body and then large wicks either side. So just like this one, um, and you know this one as well that we have in the price there, and also that one that I just showed you. These are really good for supply and demand zones because basically what this shows is a consolidation. Uh, you know, we spoke about consolidation when the market ranges back and forth. What the doji shows you is basically that, but on a very low time frame. So what we can actually see here with this candle is the market opened at this level. It went all the way up, it went all the way down, but it ended up closing just around the price that it opened. So really, this is a consolidation uh, just in a very small time frame and actually compacted within that single candle. So these are really good areas for supply and demand zones, and they are generally the best place to be drawing them. From this area, then, if we just cover this, what we can see is there is a supply zone there. So that could be worth focusing on. However, if we then look below, it has broken, been retested, and then sold off again. So the one you really want to focus on here is going to be this one because this one has already been retested. So the best, most fitting zone for this would be that one just there. And as we can see, this is also the zone that broke structure leading on to what we spoke about before. We obviously had lower low, lower high. Then we had a sell off forming another lower low. This broke the structure. So when we pull back into the zone that broke structure, that is where we want to sell. So that is a good example of a bearish trend supply zone. Okay, supply zone in a bearish trend. That's how you apply it. That's how you execute it. All the while you need to be thinking of, is this zone already retested? Because the thing with supply and demand zones is when it has been retested, it doesn't have as much power anymore. So it's very rare that we're going to see a movement, you know, that, that moves like this, where we fill a supply zone and then come back into it again, or fill a demand zone and then come back into it again. We've obviously already filled this one with that break and retest. So now we've sold off again, we'll be looking towards the, the one that hasn't been retested yet. And also the zone that broke structure to actually execute any sell trades. So there we go then. If we just follow the trend structure and I'll show you some more zones as well while we're here, what we can see is lower low, lower high, lower low, lower high. Selling opportunity came about there. We sell off something like this. So just as an example position. And then what actually happened at this point, and then what happened at this point was we formed a reversal and we went from lower low to higher high. So at this point we see our first initial break of structure where we go from lower lows and lower highs to a higher high just here. This high has actually swept out the previous lower high and also the one before that as well. So this is where we get the first shift of movement into a bullish market trend. What we can then do is look for the zone that broke structure. So that would be this one here. Pick out this zone and that is where we would look for our first buys because the trend has gone from bearish to bullish. So what I'm showing you here is supply and demand applied on a reversal area. You get to see the sell side of it and then when structure breaks, we pull back in and there's actually going to be a buying side of it as well, where we can then sweep up buys from this area to take higher in the trend. Now, as you can see, and as I actually just said, it's rare that we get a supply zone or a demand zone retested twice. We can see that that did actually happen here. This isn't a common thing, but what this has done is come and trade into the middle of the zone. When you're trading on higher time frames, 15 minutes or above, you can actually opt for the middle point for entries because it often is going to get tapped. Now, when we are trading low time frames, this isn't such a good approach. That's all going to be covered, of course, in the low time frame and high time frame application process. But just an important note for now is that the middle point of a zone is a very good one to buy from or sell from if you're on the 15 minute, 30 minute, hourly, four hour, daily, and so on. You'll see from this example that worked out, we had the midpoint retest on this zone for the sell. And then on this one, yes, we did have the light retest, could have been a profitable trade there, but we then pulled down. And before we broke the structure, this next structure point here, you'll notice that we did indeed get a midpoint tap. So that would have been a really, really good place to actually buy from with a very nice entry and very, very low drawdown on that trade. So that is a demand zone after a reversal. These are some of the best ones to actually buy into because we've only just initiated a new trend. So we are getting in you know, near to the bottom and we can actually extend this pretty far. And then what we have had from there is another higher high. The market came down, traded into this demand area, which we may look to refine on a lower time frame. 
And that is another quick tip as well. Refining the zone to a lower time frame is going to give you a clearer area. So let's say, for example, the market's not showing us too much on those higher time frames, but we scale it down to the five minute here. We see that the market did come in and retest that very nicely. So refining zones is good. I will talk about that more so in high time frame application, low time frame application as well. Uh, but for the meantime, basically what we can do is just refine the zone down so that we get a clearer area. I mean, we can just work with the whole zone, but if we want to get the big risk reward trades, like we talked about in the risk management section, we want to have those refined areas. Regardless though, you would have got a nice trade on here to buy the market up and continue it. And I believe at this point, we did fail to make a new high and the market did break down. But regardless, we reached the previous high. This would have been a profitable position, at least to quite a strong degree. Stop losses for me personally uh, would have been here just to highlight to you the effectiveness of the strategy we're using. Meaning had we brought in on the top of this zone with stops under the low, we would still be looking at a 2.2 R movement, even though the target did not get fulfilled. So that is um, supply and demand basically applied on a chart. When you're in a downtrend, you are looking for a break of structure and then following a break of structure, you want to plot a supply zone on. And then when price comes into that area, that is a prime place to sell. In a demand zone, when the market is going up, forming higher highs and higher lows, we want to look towards the previous higher lows for demand areas. And we're usually looking for the zone that broke structure. We can mark those on using doji candles, the last candle before structure broke, the last candle before impulse, and so on. And from there, when the market comes in, we can actually look to buy. If the market continues to make a higher high, we can look towards the previous higher low, mark on a zone, wait for it to be retested, and ride the trend. So basically, supply and demand is the first step in understanding how to follow structure. We can see here we have an uptrend and we can see that the entries all came from trading these great little supply and demand zones. So we will elaborate more on supply and demand throughout the course. You're going to learn a lot about this concept, but this is an introduction to understand what it is, how it works, how to plot it and how it actually comes in line with the market structure that we trade. So that is supply and demand. A few other pointers to go through now, and then we'll move on to the next video. A few key considerations now, if you are looking to trade supply and demand successfully. First of all, only trade with the trend. So in an uptrend, only trade demand zones. And in a downtrend, only trade supply zones. Demand zones and supply zones can be used for targets. We will talk about that in the future. You should never actually use them for entries against the trend. So looking at this downtrend area here, we are going to see that a bunch of demand zones do form, right? There's one here before this impulse. There's also going to be one just here. And there's also going to be one, you know, a little bit further down as well towards this area. But the problem is with this and also one there. Yeah. So the problem is with this, though, is um, we're in a downtrend, right? So there's actually no reason to be buying. So until we see a structural break, like what we spoke about in the uh, structure video, there is no reason to buy these demand zones because we are moving down. And if we buy against a falling market, we are going to lose. So you can see that if we brought this demand zone, we would have lost. If we'd have brought you know, this demand zone area here, we would have lost. If we brought this demand zone here, we would have lost. If we brought this one here, we would have lost and so on. Whereas trading the supply zones, you can continually sell into the market when the opportunities arise and you're just going to be able to ride the trend down. Now, when the market shifts and the trend shifts, that's when the time you should start focusing on demand zones, not supply zones. When we get a few breaks of structure like this, which is showing us that we are ready to move to the upside, we no longer want to focus on supply zones. If we have a look at this area, for example, you would have taken a losing trade if you were trying to sell in, but the structure has told us that the market is now bullish. We've made a higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, so we should not be actually selling supply zones. We can see once again, had we sold some of these other supply zones, for example, like this one, we would have lost. The only one that would have been successful is actually this one at the end here. And this is just by complete luck, okay? There is no strategy to this being successful. It's just that the market decided to fail around this previous price area. So making sure that you're trading with the actual trend and only buying demand in uptrends and only selling supply in downtrends is very important for long-term good results. That is a key consideration of supply and demand. So here's a little diagram of that. Let's say we're in an uptrend from this point, we have a higher high, higher low. We want to buy demand, but we do not sell supply. Then when we push through higher high, higher low, we want to buy demand, but we will not sell supply. Higher high, higher low, buy demand, 
and then when the market fails to make a new high, we don't have any confirmation the trend is shifting yet. But when the market structure breaks down and forms a bearish break of structure, like we spoke about in the previous video, that is where we can then stop buying demand and look towards selling supply. Because we have here uptrend shifting into a downtrend, which is confirmed at this point, and then we can start selling into the trend. Okay, So supply zones and demand zones will form absolutely everywhere, but knowing how to read them and which ones you should and shouldn't trade is very important. In an uptrend, demand. In a downtrend, supply. Until the market structure tells you that it has shifted, do not do anything different. So thank you for watching this video. That was a good introduction to supply and demand, showing you where it comes in the market, how to plot it, how to use it in line with the trend. In the next video, we're going to talk about something called market efficiency, which is coming in line with both the concepts we've spoken about so far. It all kind of comes into a process, but we're really going to go through processes when we hit the high time frame and low time frame application sections of the course. So without further ado, let's move on to the next video. I'll see you over there. Make sure you take notes. And if you do need to recap this video, definitely do that. You need to make sure you are down and sound with every single concept we talk through before we move on to the next.